Welcome everyone. Uh, this is just the first of a series of educational webinars on latest developments in gene therapy for Gaucher treatment. And today we are focusing on a Propius lentiviral gene therapy. It's an ex vivo gene therapy approach for type 1 Gaucher disease. But before we start with that, I will ask uh, Professor Timothy Cox to uh, introduce, to send the, set the scene for this lecture. Uh, he's uh, a professor uh, of medicine emeritus and director of research at the University of Cambridge. He's well known is uh, in our Gaucher community, and I'm sure that most of you already uh, have heard some lectures from him. So please, Professor Tim, uh, you can start with your lecture. Well, thank you very much, uh, Vesna. Thank you very much, and um, good afternoon, good morning everyone from the IGA. What a, what a wonderful setup you are. You, um, internationally, you're, you're into everything and that's, that's really marvellous. I, I was just going to give an introduction before we hear from Dr. Chris Mason, um, Professor Mason, um, who is, is going to give the main presentation, but I thought I'd just give a little bit of background to, to how his gene therapy program of AvroBio is, is planning to work. Slide um, you'll be very familiar with is the immortalization of the young physician Dr. Gaucher, who described what we originally thought of as the type 1 Gaucher disease in a patient that he did look after as a young doctor for many years and then uh, finally did the analysis of her in uh, 1881. But his report is very detailed, still available, and it shows you what he found. He found of course, a very, very large liver and spleen from this very neglected lady that he looked after with a very long history of illness without any treatment. And he looked at her liver and spleen under the microscope, the technology of the day, and he saw these very big cells in it, which you don't normally see, as on this image here, which he drew himself. Ernest Gaucher drew those himself. So there we are. Now, if we look today, and this is a spleen actually from my own first patient taken now many, many years ago, who also suffered from bleeding and a huge distension of his abdomen with a very large liver and spleen, you can see exactly the same thing. Those cells in the spleen, very large, down in the bottom left-hand corner and in the middle of the, of the lower panel, they are macrophages. They're strange macrophages which stain very specially there, as you see in blue above. That's from a bone marrow from another patient. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, electron micrograph under high magnification. And there you can see the, um, the, the, the distended spaces in the cell, which are full of storage material that you need. Well, it's the macrophages that principally show disease and you all know what they are better than I do, even though I've met many, many, many patients with um, so the anemia, the fatigue in little children, uh, growth delay, I'm quite sure myself. Is there, they tend to be quite delayed through illness though. Easy bruising, a bleeding tendency, very difficult in young ladies, reduced appetite, pain in the tummy, bone pain, which Dr. Gaucher didn't recognize, and fractures and all sorts of things that need to be put right. There are treatments that put this right. And one of them, of course, was what's been really referred to as the gold standard, although that might be challenged now, which is enzyme therapy, first done from the enzyme company, with the work from the National Institutes of Health, where a targeted therapy would go to the macrophages in the spleen and liver and in the bone marrow, as you see on this image here, from one of our patients studied by Pram Mystery and myself all those years ago here in Cambridge. In the early days of enzyme therapy, we labeled it and did a study with patients in the UK showing how that drug, how that targeting occurred in the very massive spleen here and the liver of a patient that spleen had to be removed. It had a large abscess in it, as you can see. 
but we, before the operation, we were able to show this dramatic targeting. So it really worked and gets to the place to restore the enzyme. And after that time, from the work of Dr. Brady and others, there are other enzyme therapies now. Started off with Seridase in very early 1990s. Then Serozyme, a safer recombinant preparation made by genetic engineering, by the Genzyme therapy, now available from Sanofi. Repriv, a treatment coming in later during a, a crisis of supply, it was possible for that to be launched, and that was from the Shire company, originally TKT. And then another company with an approved drug that produces taliglucerase and Elisac. These are the three approved drugs in the world, and there are two others which are biosimilars, which are, 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 you hear about from time to time. And that first patient there, who's still alive, head of the National Goshen Association now, as a little boy was treated in the mid-1980s experimentally, and he was the only one who showed a dream. Well, this young lady was an early child of ours and has done so well. Very encouraging. On enzyme therapy, one of the first in the UK, in the UK NHS, was 70 years old. Um, there was a celebration and Dawn Marie, very kindly here, a young lady and mother of two, thought to have had leukemia because she was so well and bleeding and so on as a child, improved wonderfully. And after 25 years, she's a mother, a very capable lady and an attorney and, and has a very successful career. And she wanted this image to be released uh, to show how grateful she was for all the work that was done by the event. Which is in a way, a gold standard for what you can do for patients with type 1 Gaucher disease, the non neuropathic form, and indeed some patients are neuropathic form benefits. Now, what we're about today, well, this is something that happened even earlier. This is the understanding that the macrophages are the main focus for this. These are cells that are found in every tissue in the body, but they originate in the adult from the bone marrow, go out into the blood and find their site in the tissue macrophages of the lungs and the spleen particularly, back in the bone marrow as well, where they do their work of remodeling after injury, of keeping things clean, preventing uh, immune reactions from occurring, making sure that we have immunity to the proper things in the, if a microbe comes and infect us, they're part of the, the innate immune system. They are, and they're very important for that. And also they recirculate and recycle uh, the blood cells. That is why they have a big load in this condition because blood cells are turning over so fast. Now in the early days, it was recognized you could possibly do a bone marrow transplant replacing the macrophage from severely affected people with and the first survivor of this therapy way back in, in 1982 was the young Swedish lady called Lina. Lina was treated at uh, age nine and uh, and she she as you can see there she's on the on the right actually of the upper image there and then on the right of the, of the middle picture with Dr. Anders Eriksson, who is one of the team. And then, as you can see there from Sweden, uh, in the left, in northern Sweden, in Nobotnia, where, where she lived. Well, Lina was, of course, the founding person for the Swedish Goshen Association. Her parents founded it all those years ago. But the treatment was successful for her. And we had a patient who's 47 years old now, also transplanted, who is perfectly well, having been very, very unwell indeed at the age of 18 months. And he was treated in the UK and is the longest surviving male with this condition, uh, working on a farm, um, having had his transplant. Everything cleared from his body when he had and This is the image of quite a few patients treated in that way who began to grow, as you can see their growth, and whose spleen and liver cells of Gaucher were replaced. There's a, a list of six. 
And what we're talking about is something that adds on to that because bone marrow transplantation or now known as hematopoietic stem cell transplantation is not uh, so, so trivial really because it's necessary for patients to be conditioned for them to have their own marrow uh, removed for the donor marrow, which has to be the right match to be transplanted successfully and to find its niche living again to release competent macrophages. And so it's quite a thing, this. And here we have a trial, which is using that principle uh, developed by Dr. Stefan Carlson, who's worked with the first gene therapy trials in the early 90s, uh, alongside Roscoe Brady, and has kept in there all these years. And this program has been in development for 15 years now, taken over and adapted for clinical use by AvroBio, a gene therapy company based in Boston, United States, quite close to where the original Genzyme was, and where many of the companies are actually in this field. And it's pioneering this phase one, two vector gene therapy based on a lentiviral vector system. That's what the trial's called at two sites in Australia, in Mel Royal Melbourne Hospital, where it's recruiting. And in we, one patient, we will hear much more about this, has been in fact engaged and treated early on in University of Calgary uh, in, in Alberta, Canada. The principle here is similar to marrow transplantation. You don't have to take the donor marrow from the bone marrow, a bit painful. You can take it from the peripheral blood today. But here, the donor is the patient themselves. And this is a trial based of a work now, an approved therapy, done also in Boston by the Bluebird Bio Company. Well, for a treatment for thalassemia, a blood disease where it's necessary to uh, replace the red cells of the blood by competent ones that don't have thalassemia. But the principle from their, their diagram here is very much the same. The donor is the patient. And the lentiviral therapy, which you take the donor stem cells from their marrow outside in the laboratory and give them a viral vector which will express at random sites it is into the cells, express the normal enzyme, the glucocerebrosidase, or glucosyl ceramidase, if you want the more modern name, that is the corrective factor in the macrophage and indeed is crucial for the marrow to function normally in glacier patients. And so this is uh, what the plan is. You take it out. Since they belong to the patient, you don't have to do tissue typing because they will be accepted they won't be so readily rejected by the patient by an immune mechanism. However, they do have to find their niche. And so some conditioning of the patient, as we'll hear, is necessary. That's the principle. It's part of the evolving therapies. We started with actually stem cells, as well as now called DNA. We don't do that anymore because donors are few and far. But this gene transfer system is based on that principle of a cell replacement. It's a cell therapy. Molecular therapy using an enzyme was there, and there is also, as you know, an oral substrate reduction therapy. What choices there are at the moment, it is extraordinary. But it is wonderful that it goes. There will be some considerations for women and indeed young men who are thinking of having a family because there are consequences. And these are points that young people may want to raise with Dr. Mason. Dr. Mason is going to speak now, and I, I'm very, very honored to be able to introduce him. He's very distinguished. He's worked for many years and was a professor of gene therapy and related therapies at University College London. Uh, and he has pioneered the treatment of difficult genetic diseases by uh, this approach, gene therapy for many years and has been very successful. He's very well known in Britain, but a couple of years ago, he accepted the offer to become uh, the CEO, I think, of, of Avro Bio to pioneer this therapy for important diseases like Gaucher. And that is what he's doing now. As I say, we, we do know each other, as it were, we belong to a similar 
academy, but we, I don't think we've met anyway, not, not properly for many years. But it's wonderful to have him here to tell us about his, the work that he cares about so much and about his company's plans to investigate this therapy for potential use in dementia patients. So Dr. Chris Mason, Professor Mason to me, you're welcome to give your presentation. Thank you very much indeed to the IGA. So thank you very much for everyone spending the time today to, um, to listen to our presentation on investigational lentiviral gene therapy for type one Gaucher disease. Uh, can I have my, my first main slide? So this is the areas which I plan, plan to cover. I'm going to cover the basics of gene therapy, um, whether it's lentiviral or AAV in different modalities. Um, I'm going to cover our technology, at, but a, at a high level, and then a bit about our um, clinical trial and our approach to Gaucher type one, and then end up with a summary. So we have our first slide. Right. So this is the team which I'm proud to represent. Um, we founded the company back in 2015, and our, our goal was to treat patients such that they could have a freedom from a lifetime of disease through gene therapy by either reversing or halting the disease with just a single dose of their own cells modified genetically so that there's an additional copy of the gene, and I'll come back to that. This is the team, um, all looking very happy in our Cambridge office pre-COVID. Um, at the moment, the labs are fully working and everybody's working, the rest of the teams are, are working from home and everything's going ahead beautifully. Um, we have four programs. Um, yeah, we can, we can move on. We have four programs. Um, the first is our Fabry study, where the patients are out maybe three years now. Um, there is a phase one, which is a safety study, which we've worked on with um, uh, the um, a Canadian group called the FACTS team. And then we've got our own phase two study, which is also recruiting, looking at safety and efficacy. For Gaucher, we have recruited our very first patient. And for cystinosis, this is an investigator sponsored study. So this is run by, the, by UCSD uh, in San Diego, and, and they have now treated two patients. And we also have an in-house uh, pompa disease program, which is in late stage of putting together the necessary um, preclinical data for uh, a filing for a BLA. What I should say is that um, lentiviral gene therapy for lysosomal disorders is still investigational. And that means it's not yet been approved by the US FDA or any other regulatory ag agency for physicians to prescribe to patients. And it's all research that's currently evaluating its safety and efficacy in clinical trials. And that's really important, that sentence. So let's go to the basics. So stepping right back, what are you trying to achieve? So this is the basic unit which we are working on, the cell. Our therapies work at the cellular level. And we heard from Tim that the macrophage is particularly important to us because that's the uh, center of focus for Gaucher disease. And like any other cell, the macrophage will have uh, a nucleus and within that nucleus is the DNA and the DNA is really the hereditary material that carries everybody's unique genetic code and there you see it there the double strand described by Watson and Crick and we've highlighted an area which we've said is a gene so along this piece of DNA or chromosome are the genes and they're basically sections of DNA and they carry instructions for amongst other things making proteins that the body needs. And so this is where we wish our, our therapy to work. We're not a small molecule or a biologic. We're actually working at the gene level, and that's very important. Next slide, please. And really, what does a gene do? So a gene is a strand of double-stranded DNA, as we said, that lives in the nucleus of all our nucleated cells, including the macrophages. And for it to make a protein, it has to first turn itself into a piece of RNA. That just has to make a copy. The DNA always stays in the nucleus. And to make protein, it has to have some way of getting the message out of the nucleus of the cell into the cytoplasm, into the rest of the cell, because that's where proteins are made. And to do that, it makes a messenger strand, so-called RNA. That is then 
goes out of the nucleus and it goes to the protein making machinery. And we call that translation. But what that basically means is that we turn that strand of communicating RNA into a precise string of amino acids. And we've represented them here by four different shapes. Um, the, what, what's four or five different shapes. What's required is you need the right amino acids and you need them in the right order. And that's really important because they form as a string and only if they're in the right order will they then fold properly to make the protein that's required. If they don't fold properly, then the protein is defective. And the best way to think about this is like a lock and a key. So everybody knows on this call that the enzyme is required to break down a substrate. And to do that, the substrate and the protein have to fit together precisely. If they don't fit, the, the, the enzyme cannot work. And to get the right shape requires the amino acids to be in the right order. So if one is in the wrong place or missing, or it's the wrong amino acid, then it's a problem. And here we see a variant of the gene, and it's got a small error. And that error is, is communicated to the messenger RNA. And then that gives the wrong message to the, to the protein manufacturing system in terms of the amino acid. And we go from a nice square to a round. Still a string of amino acids, but now, because it's got the wrong one there, it folds in a different configuration. And now the lock and the key no longer fit together and the enzyme no longer works. And that is the challenge. So the cells um, in Gauche type one, basically there is a mutation in the DNA that's reflected in the RNA that causes the amino acid sequence to be disrupted in some way. And that ends up with a protein that is misfolded. And then the key and lock cannot fit together. So the enzyme can no longer engage properly with the substrate and therefore cannot break it down. We go to the next slide, please. So what is gene therapy and how does it work? So as I, as I mentioned earlier, it's all about using genetic material. Most drugs are either proteins or small molecules. Uh, and we're moving a whole concept along to using genetic material instead. So this is a step change for therapeutics. And the goal is very much to have long-term treatment or even potentially cure of genetic disorders. With proteins and small molecules, by and large, they tend to be need to be taken on a very regular basis. There are a few exceptions, such as say an antibiotic, you take it long enough to eradicate the bacteria and then no longer need to take it. But for genetic disorders, on the whole, um, it requires constant taking on a regular basis of either a small molecule or a protein, SRT or ERT. And what we're aiming to do is to actually transfer a therapeutic gene, and we call that therapeutic gene a transgene. It's not, it's not a gene that exists in the body. It does produce the protein that's absent in the body, but it's not exactly the same. So we call it a transgene or therapeutic gene. And we do not, we do not change the original um, piece of DNA which had the variant in it. We leave that, that's fine, that doesn't cause any problems, it just doesn't make the right enzyme. And what we do is we add in our therapeutic gene so that there's an extra copy effectively, and that augments it, or gene addition it's called. But basically there is now a, a piece of DNA that is capable of making functional protein, which is lacking from those cells. And the idea that that functional piece of DNA produces functional protein and that improves or restores the proper cellular function. In the case of the macrophages, it turns them from being a Gaucher cell back to a regular macrophage. We've got some fancy terms, and one is expression cassette. Um, all that means is that this, this, this therapeutic gene we talked about is put into a piece of DNA, and with it is a little uh, piece of DNA just in front of it, which switches it on. Think of it as a switch. And that enables that gene to then work. It's switched always on, um, because if you just put in the transgene on its own, nothing would happen. It needs something in front of it just to say, right, work, run, and that's called a promoter. 
Um, and that enables the protein to be made in exactly the same manner as we've just discussed. So this piece of DNA will go into the nucleus. It will incorporate into the genome in some cases. In other cases, it, doesn't, it, it won't do that. It works in a diff slightly different way. But nonetheless, the piece of DNA is in the nucleus. That, that piece of DNA is then converted into mRNA, which leaves the nucleus and makes the, makes the functional protein that we desire. And that's, that's what the expression cassette is. It's that piece of DNA, and we show it in the bottom left of the figure, little promoter reason that drives the gene, so we produce the protein, and then the therapeutic genetic material in the magenta. Once inside the cell, um, the vector does a number of different things. So on the right-hand side, we actually show it's our vector, but it, it, it's pretty typical of most vectors. There's really two key components. There's genetic material, which we show here as magenta, and that contains the expression cassette. And then some means of getting that vector into the cell. Think about it as a letter and an envelope. The letter's got the instructions, what needs doing, that's the, um, the magenta, the DNA, and it's coated in some way so that it can be put into the cell. You can't just, um, um, just put in the DNA. That won't, that won't work. It's a bit like posting a letter. You've got to have an envelope. If you just put your letter in the post, it's not going to be delivered. If we go to the next slide. And there are a number of different ways you can do gene therapy. And what I'm going to dwell on is the two most common ones. So I'm going to look at the right hand side first. So this is the simplest of all gene therapies, so called in vivo. And what that means is that the vector itself which carries the, the um, genetic material is put in directly into the person. Um, basically, it has a, as we've discussed, an outer layer and then the actual genetic code that we need to get into the cells. And that's depicted by that little picture there. And this is typical of something called adeno associated viral vector, AAV vector for short. And this is typically used in this in vivo manner directly. Typically, um, it can be injected directly into the area it's required, such as the eye or the brain, or it can be put in intravenously where it's carried around in the blood. And on the whole, they target the liver. Um, it's interesting in that it doesn't integrate. So what do I mean by that? Well, this piece of, it's actually DNA in the case of, a, of an AV, goes into the cell but doesn't incorporate into the nucleus of the cell. It's so-called episomal, but all that means is it basically sits in the nucleus, but does not become part of the chromosomes. Now, the challenge there is that when the cells divide, you can actually lose the, the, the actual um, vector itself. It's not incorporated into the chromosomes. So when the chromosomes divide, multiply in number, and then half of them go with, with one daughter cell and the other half go with the other, the AV gets left behind in so-called washout. So it tends to be used where the cells are very permanent, such as in the eye, such as in the back of the eye, uh, where the cells don't divide. The cells that you're born with are pretty much the same cells as you die with. So it's very good if you've got a permanent cell, cell line. Um, on the left-hand side is the alternative. So the left-hand side is ex vivo gene therapy. And that is where you actually take cells from the person and then add the vector outside. And so the advantage here is you can very precisely target the cells you want because you can select them from the person and then basically um, purify them or enrich for them such so you have a good percentage of the cell type you absolutely want. So good for targeting. And the other nice thing is that you can freeze the cells and that gives you time to test and to make sure that the cells are absolutely what you require and then thaw and put back into the patient. The other difference, which is I think worth mentioning, is that for these particular vectors, the DNA is actually incorporated into the actual chromosomes. So when they divide, the daughter cells get a copy of the expression cassette. So the actual transgene goes into the cells, the daughter cells 
of the original uh, cell that was um, treated with the vector. So, there's, so that way you can actually treat cells which divide. And when do we get division? Well, we get division when we're growing, very rapid division, in fact, when we're growing. And we also get division um, when we're trying to, say, heal a disease or regenerate an organ. So it's important. But both systems have got advantages. And I think you know, it depends upon what disease you're really trying to treat. If you've got one which has got permanent cells, then AAV is a possible suggestion. And if you've got cells which are dividing, then um, an ex vivo approach can be, can, you know, can, can, can very happily deal with that, whereas the AAV challenge is a challenge because of washout. If we go to the next slide. And I'm now going to describe the approach that we've taken for all of our um, lysosomal disorders, Fabry, Gaucher, Pompa, cystinosis, all follow the same process. And it is very much the same process that Professor Cox talked about at the beginning when he highlighted uh, Bluebird's approach to uh, adrenoleukodystrophy. This is a, a very um, tried and tested method of introducing um, genes into both animals and people. And so if we start at position one, first of all, we have to collect the cells. Remember we said that you, these are cells that are taken from the person. So we have to collect them, which, which is um, a process that we've borrowed from the world of transplant. We actually need to use um, stem cells that are in the bone marrow. We need to get those cells out of the bone marrow. Uh, how we do this is we use um, two drugs which are frequently used, GCSF and Perixophore, but those drugs, what they do is they release the particular cells, the blood stem cells from the bone marrow. So instead of just sitting in the bone marrow, they now come out into the blood. And once they're in the blood, we can collect them. The process is called apheresis. It's done tens of thousands of times a year and basically incorporates taking blood out of one arm. It's processed in a machine and goes back into the other arm. And it takes about three or four hours to collect the cells we really need with all the rest of the blood going back. And then it's then sent off to our manufacturing team who basically further enrich it to really get those CD34 cells, get a nice pure population for us. And once we've got that, we then add our vector. And that enables us to put in that transgene, that therapeutic gene into the patient's own cells. And we then, at that point, freeze all the cells. Um, it's now become our drug product because it's got the um, actual uh, genetic material we desire in it. And now, what we do is we test it. it. Takes about six to eight weeks to test, and we test that it's that it's um, you know, it, it's properly made and safe and ready to go back. And also, it allows time to schedule uh, an appointment to have the cells put back in again. So it's elective. So there's you know we can make it very convenient for uh, patients and healthcare providers, so that we can schedule when those cells need to go back in. And there's no particular rush. Um, we've taken these cells out six months, so we know we've got at least a six month window and it's probably longer, but our, our current testing says that we can do that up to six months afterwards. And then I'll come back to it, but we need to actually create space in the bone marrow. Now, what does that mean? Well, remember I told you at one, we've got to get the cells out of the bone marrow. The challenge is, is that when they leave, <laughs> their homes go and they've no longer got a home to go to. And so what we have to do is we actually have to use um, some, a, a drug called busulfan, which is used regularly for transplants to enable us to make that space in the bone marrow compartment so that when we re-thaw the cells and reinfuse them, they can then go to the bone marrow where they can then home. And then they're there for the, the person's lifetime, producing more blood cells. Um, and in, a, in the blood cells they produce, is a copy of our, of our expression cassette, and therefore those cells should produce the protein that we're interested in. If we go to the next slide. So this is our, our platform. This is our investigational gene therapy platform. 
Um, you see it on the left-hand side. That's, that's how they look. That's the actual manufacturing device made by Milteni called the Prodigy. Um, we're the only gene therapy company using those. Um, let's move on to our first slide of this batch. Great. Okay, so what we first want to do is talk just a little bit about it. And you know, everybody on this call is way, way, way more expert on this than I am. But really, what we've seen from the literature, from people like um, um, Neil, Neil Weinreb, for example, is that the long-term follow-up studies suggest there is a real unmet clinical need in Gaussian type 1, despite ERT, for example. And what, we look, what, we've, what we've shown here is a paper published by Neil back in 2008 and another one in 2013, which summarizes the data from those investigations. And he basically looked at, I think it was over 750 patients. And what he found was that 60% of patients did not achieve at least one of six therapeutic goals evaluated after four years on ERT. And that is the first column you see there. So basically it refers to anemia, bone pain, bone crisis, and moderate uh, thrombocytopenia, splenomegaly, or hepatomegaly. And so what we see there is a, a table that shows the non-splenectomized and splenectomized. Now, clearly with anemia, you would expect a much better improvement if you're uh, splenectomized rather and, and same for the platelets. And what we see here is that there is a large, um, a significant percentage of patients rather continue to exhibit um, features such as bone pain, enlarged organs and ab ab abnormal blood counts, even after a decade on ERT. And in fact, 25% of, of people continue to suffer from physical limitation after two years on ERT, primarily due to the bone disease. And the bone disease seems to be particularly highlighted. If we move on to... So this is our clinical trial. It's called GUARD-1. It's a phase one, two. That means it's principally a safety and tolerability study, but also looking for some, some pointers towards efficacy. It's for type one Gaucher disease. It's open label. What do we mean by that? We mean that you know, everybody knows which treatment you have. It's, there's no placebo. There's no uh, randomizing to a group and getting um, a drug uh, or get, just getting water. You know, the, the, it's, everybody knows whether they've had the gene therapy or not. It's multinational and we're actively recruiting in Canada and Australia. As I said, we're looking at safety and efficacy using the approach I've just described, the ex vivo lentiviral vector gene therapy approach. We are, uh, the trial is set up to look at ERT stable patients. That's patients who've, who've been on ERT for greater than 24 months or have never received treatment or have not received ERT or SRT in the last year. And to date, as I said earlier, we have dosed our first patient just, just a short while ago. So the main object, sorry, sorry, just up slide back. So the main objectives are safety, efficacy. It's called engraftment. What we mean there is have we created that space and has our gene therapy cells, gene modified cells, I should say, gone into the bone marrow and we will be looking at ERT independence because people will come off ERT when they're infused with their um, investigational gene therapy. Our goal is to enroll eight to 16 patients uh, that are aged 18 to 35, male and female in Australia and Canada. And patients will need a confirmed diagnosis. That's really important. And that's based on a genotype. It's based on the activity of glucocerebrosidase, the enzyme that's impacted, and also clinical features consistent with Gaucher type 1. And we do have a, uh, a, a, um, a page on the clinicaltrials.gov site, and the actual uh, code there is there at the bottom, and I'm sure that um, our team would be very happy to, to circulate that, that clinicaltrials.gov code so people can look up online more about the study. So this is the participation timeline. So before patients can enter the study, there's a screening period, it takes about eight weeks. And the, the, the area there is really to make sure that, that the, everybody has proper informed consent. Um, so we make 
people are very aware of what the potential risks and benefits of participating in the trial are. are. And we will also need to undergo some activities to confirm eligibility, what I've just discussed. And that could include, or will include, a physical examination, medical history, blood tests, and some imaging. If, um, if people meet the, the screening criteria, then we need to determine what their baseline is. What, 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 what can we measure prior to the gene therapy so we can compare later on to see what impact, if any, we have had. And so we need to um, do a number of studies just to get that baseline data, um, which is slightly more, more than the screening step, but really looking at things that we can measure such that uh, um, you know, later on in the study, we can compare and say, well, how do we compare to baseline? So pre-gene therapy, which is six to eight weeks, we will go through these processes which we've just described on that half circle. So mobilization, that's giving this GCSF and pleurixophore in order to get the CD34 cells to be released from the bone marrow. We use the apheresis to collect them from the blood and just take those out and return the rest of the blood. And conditioning, which I mentioned, is to make space in the bone marrow compartment. The actual gene therapy is very quick. Once we've actually um, mobilized the cells and, and manufactured them, it takes about 20 minutes to actually infuse the gene therapy. So it's a quick process. But just prior to that, there is a, a, um, a approximately six days where we need to condition uh, the person so their bone marrow has enough space for the cells to go in and be taken up. And then we follow, um, as, as it says there, for 52 weeks initially on this study, um, at various time points, 1, 2, 4, 8, 13, 26, 39, and 52. So we're basically measuring uh, safety, tolerability, and efficacy. If we go to the next slide. Yeah, I think I've, I've sort of covered this, but the conditioning is a, a process really to make this necessary space in the bone marrow. Um, gene therapists discovered a, a, about two decades ago that if you just infuse the gene modified cells, they last a short while in the blood, but they never actually home to the bone marrow and they never actually go in. And so what we actually do is um, make the necessary space by using a drug used for, for transplant. Um, it is personalized. We adjust the dose for the specific uh, person. Um, and it really depends upon the things like weight and the speed that the person metabolizes the, the conditioning agent, which is, which is just a single agent, single cycle, busulfan. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yep, and this is where we are so far. We treated our first patient back in July um, of this year, and we're awaiting initial data. And we are actively enrolling, male and female, uh, who meet the criteria I discussed earlier, confirmed diagnosis, um, ERT stable or treatment naive. Uh, we, as we said, the study duration on this study is 68 weeks, but there is then a long-term follow-up study for another 14 years, which would be under a separate trials. So I hope I've um, given at least a high level lentiviral gene therapy for lysosomal storage is, is investigational. I hope that I got that across which means that we're not approved by the FDA or EMA for physicians to prescribe to patients. And, you know, we are currently evaluating safety and efficacy in clinical trials, including one for Gaucher type one. Our investigational gene therapy platform, actually I didn't name, but it's called Plato and we're very proud of it. And it really makes a big difference, enables us to make gene therapies at scale for all the patients who could potentially need it. And we're actively recruiting for our GUARD-1 study, which is a phase 1-2 trial in patients with Gaucher disease type 1. And again, um, you, we, we, we welcome you to um, visit the clinicaltrials.gov site for more details. And anybody who is interested in participating in any clinical trial should discuss whether they're a candidate with their doctor and discuss possible risk with their doctor. And in our case, you could also discuss it with a stem cell transplant specialist, as there are the two components of both needing a, a, a doc who, who specializes in genetic uh, disorders, as well as the transplanter. And now I'm happy to take questions.
Chris, that's very kind. Thank you very much indeed, and very helpful indeed. And I um, hope you can hear me. I'm. I'm yep, hear you loud and clear, Tim. I'm, it's good. Okay. Sounding great. Very, very helpful indeed. I um, I hope you can hear me. I'm. I'm. Here. Sorry, I've been unmuted. It was suggested I. Sorry, I can't hear you, Tim. Sorry, I, I don't know if you're. Professor Tim. I'm calling in on a advice. From, I, okay. I'm calling it in on the advice of Rita Sambalas. Um, and so I have called in to the number and I've heard Chris speaking on the number. So either I can continue on the internet, which is pretty unrelated, whichever you prefer. So Tim, I can run down the Q and A's that I've got coming in on the chat. Would that help? Uh, professor, you can speak on the phone if you can. I think it will be okay on the phone. Maybe the connection will be better. I'm speaking. Oh, you are speaking. I am speaking on the phone, the okay. but it seems to have taken. Okay. Yeah, it's still a bad connection. Okay. Uh, I think it will. It's a good idea if. Speaking on the phone, but it seems to have taken. Okay. Why don't I run, Tim, why don't I run down, run through the questions because I'll, I'll read the question that I'm, that I'm addressing. Some of them, I can, unfortunately... I can read I, the questions and you can answer, no problem. Yeah, I'll read the questions. So okay. the first question I have is, where are you in the Fabry study? So Fabry uses exactly the same platform as for Gauche, as for cystinosis. They're all the same platform that we discussed in the talk. So taking cells out, genetically modifying them, put them back. And obviously for Fabry, we need to use the appropriate gene for that, that, that the specific enzyme rather, for that particular um, disease. So where are we? So we have treated and following up the first five patients in the phase one study. So that's safety and tolerability. And they are out now over 33 months. Where are phase two, we started later, um, and, they, and that's different from the phase one. The phase one looked at patients who were on enzyme replacement therapy, whereas our phase two were for, is for patients who've never been on enzyme replacement therapy. And we've treated the first four in those and are following those up as well. So those studies are underway. Um, they are very much, I mean, we are at the stage of investigating the safety and effectiveness of all our investigational gene therapies. And therefore, um, you know, we expect the trial to or trials to provide meaningful data, but at the current time, we're not really able to discuss further on these uh, for, for reasons I'm sure everybody on the call understands. So and that is true for a number of, of the Gauche questions which I've, which I've come to. So I, I just am not in a position to answer them because they are very much about an ongoing investigational gene therapy trial. So what potential safety issues do you anticipate? Again, I can't answer that question for those same reasons. You know, this is why we run the trials to answer that exact question. So that's a question that, that's uh, looking into the future and uh, you know, we will be able to answer when, we, when we've completed, completed the study. How long is the treatment process? I can absolutely discuss. So basically we need to, um, after screening the person and making sure they're appropriate for the study, then we need to take cells from the patient and we mobilize them, it takes a few days, and then we do the apheresis. And then there's a gap of about six to eight weeks while we actually test that the drug product we made has the purity and potency that we need. And then it can be basically infused back into the patient. And that's quite quick. So once we've actually uh, covered that you know, testing um, and agreed a convenient time for the person and for, and for the clinician, we, the conditioning takes four days so that basically the drug is administered every day and every day we take a small sample of blood and we test to see what is the level of that drug in the person's blood so we can do effectively personalized medicine and we adjust the dose the next day 
so we can hit a target dose that we want to achieve because we know that gives us the chance of the most optimal result. And then we have two days where we let that drug actually wash out the system. We just need to create the space and then we want the drug gone. So that's another two days. And then we infuse in our drug product, which takes about 20 minutes. And that is the treatment completed in that stage. Um, the next question is what amount of ex vivo gene cells is needed to achieve optimal results? That, that's again a question which we anticipate answering or going, to, going towards answering during the clinical trial. But what we do is we base all our um, um, infusion of cell numbers on conventional uh, bone marrow transplant, where there are very clear guidelines uh, for successful transplants. And we basically take their guidelines and use them for our gene therapy. So the next one is about screening and COVID-19. Um, again, this is, this is a challenging question for us to answer. The, the basic, the challenge is, is that the, um, the centers um, during the height of COVID, and maybe it's returning now, but during the height of COVID were redirected away to basically emergency services. Staff were redeployed. And so that, 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 is, that, is, that is the um, impact or potential impact on enrollment in our clinical trials? Are the centers up and running or are there resources re redeployed to other areas of, of more important need within the hospital? I don't, uh, right, where am I on the question? Sorry. How many patients do we foresee? Well, we haven't given any guidance, but, uh, but I've given you the targets that we, we plan to get over, and that will take a few years to enroll all the patients. And it's, it's also fairly hard to, to, to give precise numbers because we don't know what the impact of COVID on centres may be. Um, Yeah, so we agree with the next comment. The burden of the gene therapy intervention should not be heavier than the burden of Gaucher disease. The, 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 the whole idea of gene therapy in general, and I don't, I'm not speaking for Avro's gene therapies, but gene therapy in general, is very much to you know, halt um, or, or slow disease progression with a once and done therapy. And, and that holds for all gene therapy. Yeah, so, the, so I'm asked about the dosing. The dosing is very straightforward. Um, it, it, it did sound, maybe, maybe I made it sound a little bit too complicated. So the question is, how will the dosing be performed in future in clinics on patients given the complex personalized dosing? So it sounded complex, but it's something that's done regularly for a large number of other drugs in, in hospital use. So a, a number, of, number of drugs, you don't need to worry too much about the precise dose. We all handle them in the same way. but a number like antibiotics, like vancomycin, for example, and other, other drugs, they need to be monitored. And the reason for that is that um, different people metabolize them at different rates. And also the same person uh, metabolizes them differently with over time. So you might metabolize it much faster on day one and much slower on day four. And so it's, it is common practice in hospitals actually to measure, or in clinics, is to actually measure the level of the drug in the blood following dosing and then adjust accordingly. And, we, and we, do, we do this a lot. So this is, it may sound complex, but it's something that's already routinely done in hospital for a number of, a number of other drugs, adjusting a dose so that it, so that it matches the patient's requirement. So it's, it's basically personalized medicine. So the question of, of age, it, it's a challenging one. It's why we do the study. Um, all I can say is that you know, transplants are routinely done, people in their 60s, 70s and older, um, but I can't comment on our particular gene therapy trial. So the answer to the question of you know, how old can we treat patients um, is really to be determined. Is, it, is intervention easier and safer with small children than with adults? Again, I, we're, this is an adult study, but if you look at studies um, at uh, Great Ormond Street um, in London, 
you will see they've done a large number of boy in the bubbles and they tend to treat those at a very young age and you can look at the look at the look at the results that, that they've achieved achieved over the last 20 years on that um, what are the biggest competitors? Yeah, so there it is. It is a landscape where there's a number of options. There's small molecules and biologics, longer acting um, enzyme replacements. There are some AVs. I think we are the only lentiviral, ex vivo lentiviral gene therapy. Um, and we really have to see what the clinical data comes out in the clinical trials. Yeah, so does the gene therapy change the genetic mutation? Um, so it, it, it doesn't change it. We, we are all, we, we're doing something called gene addition or gene augmentation. We leave the, the um, original gene in place. It, it, it doesn't cause any problems. It just produces an inactive or non-functional enzyme, but in itself appears harmless. And what we're doing is we're doing gene addition. We add in a copy or a, a DNA um, insert rather that will produce functional protein. So the cells basically produce both. They produce some of the non-functional and some of the functional. And, and the nice thing about enzymes is that you don't need much enzyme to be produced to have quite an impact because they are catalytic. A little bit goes a long way. Um, so we haven't changed the genes. And I think the other thing that's important to state is that we don't impact the next generation. So these, the cells we're modifying are only the blood cells. So the stem cells that went back into the bone marrow and all their daughter cells, all the nucleated cells, all the Bs, the T cells, the NK cells, um, and, and, and the monocytes, and importantly, the macrophages and the microglia in the brain, they are, they are modified, but the egg and sperm cells are not modified in any way. So we are not doing any germline genetic modification. So unfortunately, the gene will still be passed on, but we have not, because we have not made a change there. The only change is in the bone marrow compartment. Is the augmenting gene already tested to be working with everyone? Again, I can't answer that question. That's why we're, we're gonna do the clinical trial. Um, Then we've got, what is the idea about what Avro will do and what the own physician? So absolutely, I mean, we, we, may, we may make the drug um, or the investigational drug, I should say, but we absolutely um, will, will work with, with, the, um, with, with the person's clinician. That's, that's vital. They are the front line and, and we're here to support and help them. And Fernanda and her team try and help, help you know, the learning process um, as, as does our clinical team. So no, we are... Uh, we, we may be providing the drug product, but we're absolutely going to be working through um, through the clinicians who are looking after everybody. I think I think I'm almost out of questions. Is that right? Um, Chris, mm. can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. That's much better. Oh, really. um, so. I, I was just going to ask you a couple of questions, um, and they are quite tough, I suppose. Some have been tough. Uh, one is, what do you think it has additional to BMT? Um, I imagine the risks are about the same. Um, BMT risks are far less than they used to be. But that's one thing. What's the additional advantage? And I suppose the other one is, and it's related really, you mentioned it in your business about eggs and sperm. What's the position of young people? What do young people want to do? There are some therapies that young mothers or young, young ladies who are thinking about having children would not wish to have. What, what do they do? What sort of decision making do you see for the future on that sort of person? They're great questions, Tim. Um, unfortunately, with my commercial hat on, I'm, I'm, I'm unable to re make a comparison to ERT. I mean, we are BMT. carrying out this study and I can't really comment because you know, they yeah. are questions relating to safety and efficacy and we are very much still in the clinical trial stage. And I'd love to, be, I'd love to know the answers and happy to share them when we have them. But unfortunately, Thank this you. moment in time, I can't speculate like that. I'm sorry. Thank you. That, that, it was BMT was the comparison rather yeah, than... I can't make that comparison. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And the other one was young people. Obviously, this is something that does come up with 
with uh, comparable types of therapy for genetic diseases. So young ladies, particularly young men, um, who are in the reproductive age group, um, who are quite a lot of our patients, uh, how can they be negotiated around this business of, um, of, of gene therapy by, by the, 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 the program, the very interesting program you have? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think this is that they need to go back to their um, the clinician who's looking after them and discuss it in detail for their specific situation with the clinician. Um, I think you know we 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 try our best to 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 share the information we have with the clinicians, and, and, and you know we hope that they can then pass it on to, to patients. But it's very much um, patient specific, um, and I think we also need to learn much more from the clinical trials. I mean, we've just treated the first patient back in July, so we're really early in the process. I'm afraid. Um, I'd love to share more with everyone, but we just we just don't have the information at this moment in time but we really do expect our trial to produce uh, meaningful clinical data uh, that will enable inform us and everybody else as to the merits of ex vivo lentiviral gene therapy. Well, absolutely, thank you very much for that fair answer at this stage, absolutely. Yeah, we see the clinicians as vital, absolutely critical to this. Um, and uh, we're working very hard, our clinical team and our, and our patient teams are working very hard to make sure that the that, 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 that we educate the clinicians, because this is new. It's a big step from small molecule and um, protein drugs, which you treat, take on a regular basis to a once and done gene therapy. And that, that's a big step and, and, and there is work to do there. But as we see, there are gene therapies now being approved, both AVs and ex vivo lentiviral gene therapies by the regulators. There is another question. I'm not sure if you addressed it, which is, Thanking you, this is from uh, Dr. Klein, currently in Santiago, Chile, I think. Um, so thank you for the clear talk. Uh, and uh, he wondered if there was any particular time window for the ex vivo therapy and whether or not you felt that the neuropathic disease uh, wa was part of your target program one day. Yeah, so it, it's really interesting. So ex vivo gene therapy, um, there is already an approved product in Europe. It's not the same, it uses the retrovirus rather than the lenti, but nonetheless, um, it is approved in Europe uh, for uh, basically for in the bubble, skid, as, as, um, skid ADA, I should say. Um, the, so they're already out there, Bluebird with, and you commented upon it earlier, um, with their thalassema has a conditional approval in Europe. So, the time frame for ex vivo gene therapy is that they, they've started to, um, to deliver into the clinic. But I, I should just stress that our ones are definitely still in the investigational stage, um, looking at both safety and effectiveness. And we just don't have that data yet. Um, what about gene therapies for neuropathic forms of disease? Yep, we absolutely agree. Um, but our starting point is Gaucher type one. And that, that's where we're gonna generate our initial data. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are no open questions now, I think, um, unless Vesna has any or, or any of the panel who've been running around doing the organization internationally. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah well, I, 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 I'm not sure if uh, we saw the question from Atif that we had at, actually in uh, chat. He says, does gene therapy change the genetic mutation means that autosomal recessive nature of genes or just eliminates ERT dependency of patients? Yeah, I mean, so yes, sorry, I obviously didn't answer that very well. Um, I'll come back. <laughs> so basically, um, we, we do not change the genetic mutation. We are not gene editing. We're not making a change to that mutation or variation, I prefer to call it. Um, the, that variation will stay in place and will keep producing protein and it produces the non-functional version of GKs. What we will do is put an additional copy in with the goal, uh, you know, our goal is if possible to, you know, obviously um, use the gene therapy on its own. We're thinking single agent, only gene therapy required and that no ERT is required, but that's the goal and that is what we're investigating with our drug product. So come off the ERT and you come off the ERT 
um, at the start, but our initial study um, covers both patients who've never had gene therapy and ones who are currently on, on gene therapy. So we're looking at both arms of the study so we can answer your question much better. But it will take time. There Please are, patience. Very good. Thank you. There are two questions here, one very technical and one interesting. So I'll start with the technical one. Um, so is there uh, random integration uh, and what promoter do you use? Yeah, so um, the, the Lenti system does integrate near randomly. I, I, I think it's truly random, but it's near random. Um, and it prefers to integrate, so join into the DNA in what we call the body of the genes. So that's the area of the gene that actually codes for the protein. It doesn't preferentially go into sites which are involved with growth or with control. So that's, that's an important feature. So it goes into the body of the gene. Um, we very intentionally control the level of the number of genes that actually go into the cell. And we set that at just a few copies because we see that as fairly physiological in that um, you know, it's not uncommon for people to actually uh, get more than one copy of a gene. It's a, common, it's a common mutation to have multiple copies. And we know that's safe. And then what promoter do we use? We use actually a, a promoter that's part of the system for manufacturing protein. We take it from another gene and we copy it and we pop it into our expression cassette. And it's actually a, a promoter that drives one of our other genes to do with protein manufacture. Um, and that, that's our promoter. So we use something that's already working in all of us already. Thank you, Thank you very much. There is another question which has come by me. Um, uh, enthusiastic questioner um, who says should we have neonatal screening for Gosha disease is there a particular genotype uh, that would be served or ideally serving uh, be, be served up or offered gene therapy I think it's, oh it's good question yeah so gene therapy is appropriate for all I mean it's totally um, independent of the mutation it really does not matter what it is uh, whether it's an early stop codon, which means there's virtually no protein made, or maybe something that just very slightly, you know, is a one um, amino acid change and causes, you know, a reduction in the level of production of the enzyme. So it's totally um, um, independent of whatever the genetic mutation is. Basically, by putting in our additional copy of the transgene, we've just um, overridden effectively the system to make the protein we that's required in those cells. It's a great question. Thank you for asking. Thank you very much. I think. Hey, hey I've got you now, Tim. <laughs> well, I've come in now. Great. I see. Uh, you. I just put it time uh, that you've had a when you're enjoying yourself. It's surprising how how quickly the the, the time goes. And um, I, I think uh, Amanda tells us that time is up. Chris, thank you very much for addressing a large number of questions so fluently, actually, and so gracefully. Uh, and I think I'm told that no time for any more, but perhaps they can be filed in and yep. done at a later point. So I'll thank you and um, say goodbye to everybody myself for the moment. Not that I've really been present at all, but all the very no, best. Thanks, thank you very much on behalf yeah, of- Yeah, no, thanks. Um, it's been really great. I mean, it, you know, it's really nice that so many people have given up their time to, to listen to a, a, a little bit of talk on, on, on gene therapy and I've enjoyed it. And the questions have been spectacular. So thank you very much indeed. And uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with your studies. Yeah, cheers, Thank you. For excellent questions and excellent presentations. I will look Thank forward you. to seeing you again. <laughs> Great. Look forward to it. Look forward to bringing you news on the study as, as it develops. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye-bye.